Thank you very much. Thank Welcome you. to our talk. Thanks for having us. Um, welcome to Hidden Pathways, Exploring the Anatomy of ACL-Based Active Directory Attacks and Building Strong Defenses. Very complicated title, AI help with that. Um, True. First a word about us. I'm Alexander Schmidt, I'm 37 years old. I uh, have a wife and a little daughter. In uh, my free try, I uh, like to race my bike and I'm into acoustics. On the professional side, unfortunately, I cannot say that I'm an MVP like the previous talker or did a world tour, but what, what I actually did is uh, I founded, I co-founded a company six years ago, um, Teal Technology Consulting. We're specialized in um, active directory security. Um, what that means in our case is that we are not doing all the crazy research like Dr. Asha AD before us, um, but we try to learn as much as we can from that research and translate it into an action plan for our customers to actually do something about all these attack primitives that are researched uh, by all the awesome researchers. With me is Jonas. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jonas, and um, I work as a product architect in the um, Bloodhound Enterprise team of SpectraOps. And as a product architect, I get to help uh, implement new features in uh, both the open source version and the enterprise version of, uh, of Bloodhound. I have a background as a security consulting, helping organizations find and remediate attack paths within Active Directory and building defenses such as uh, the tiering model. I'm located in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, and uh, for hobbies I, I like uh, hiking and being out in nature and being out in the, the forests, uh, far away from any AD forest. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but let's, uh, let's get started. So, um, we're going to talk about these ACL-based attack paths uh, within Active Directory. Um, and first, we're going to talk about what these ACLs are and, and how these attack narratives uh, exist um, before we're going to, to dive into like why is this still relevant and what we see in, in the industry. And then we're going to talk about like how organizations can actually uh, defend themselves against these ACL-based attack paths. We uh, did a dry run of our talk some time ago for some, some colleagues of ours, and um, we were told that our talk was uh, very German, uh, so we thought that... Um, we should add a meme or something. So, um, so uh, yeah, here's your meme. Um, yeah, if you make it all the way through uh, the presentation, we do have a lot of uh, stickers and pens and uh, also some books that you can uh, grab. And yeah, please go and grab them so we don't have to carry it all all the way home. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's start with the uh, with the basics and. Uh, what are we looking at here is the, the security descriptor of an, an Active Directory object. More specifically, it's the security descriptor of, um, of this user called Andy. And Andy, he is located within uh, a container called Users, which is in my lab environment called Dumpster Fire. Now, the security descriptor of an AD user um, contains a lot of information, but uh, what we're interested in for, for this talk here is... Um, is the DAGL or the discretionary access control list. This list here contains information about like what uh, principles in the environment can, can perform which actions on the end user. And we can see that the, this list here contains 32 um, ACs, so that's the access control entries or rules if, if you like. And let's take the first one here as an example. The first one here says that the uh, is allow permission. Uh, permissions can either be allow or deny, but this one allows this group called account operators to have full control over Andy. So that means that any member of account operators group, they can do anything against Andy. They can read all the properties and write to all the properties and reset the password of Andy or even delete Andy if they like to. Permissions can also be configured on a more granular level. So there's also an example here with a group called uh, third publishers, and they can read and write to a very specific property of Andy, um, which is related to yeah, certificates. 
the last example I want to point out is uh, this custom group I, I made called the um, Service Desk, and they have the specific permission to, to reset the password of, um, of Andy. And um, what I want you to notice here is that there's these flags out on the, the right side that show that this permission here is inherited. So that means that this permission is not configured directly on Andy, but it is configured on a parent object. In this case, it's a uh, AC that I've set on the container of Andy, so the user's uh, container, that allows the service desk group here to reset the password of all the users within this container. So the other permissions that we looked at are configured directly on Andy, but uh, yeah, this one is configured in another place, so if you change that, it will also have effects on, on other users in this container. Now, as an attacker that wants to compromise Andy, we want to find the ACs that we can abuse to gain control over Andy and yeah, maybe reset Andy's password so we can log in as Andy and abuse the permission that Andy has. Um, and as a defender that wants to prevent uh, Andy from being compromised, we're also interested in, in the ACs that can be abused. Now, reading through all the ACs and the, in the ACL list is, is, a, is a tedious task, so I definitely recommend to, to use a tool. And um, surprise, surprise, I'm going to recommend you to, to use uh, Bloodhound. So how many of you are familiar with uh, Bloodhound? Okay, that was quite a lot of you. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there are many great ACL tools uh, out there, uh, but, but Bloodhound is, is yeah, one that you can use. And um, just to make sure we're on the same page, um, Bloodhound works that way that it connects to Active Directory and creates this graph database of um, AD nodes um, where the relationships in the graph database are abusable relationships within Active Directory. So Bloodhound will go through these ACL lists and find the ACs that can be abused by attackers and create a relationship in, in Active Directory. So this allows you to look, uh, look up a, a user like Andy, for example, and check which principles can, can compromise Andy, and you can also look up what principles can Andy compromise. And the most popular feature is probably the, the path finding, so you can search for an attack path from one object to another, and in this screenshot here, we have an attack path from the Andy user to uh, a given server that uh, the Bloodhound tool can help us find, and then we can see that yeah, Andy is a member of a group that has the privilege to add members to another group, and that group has Generic always is the same as full control over this computer. So yeah, Andy can compromise uh, this computer here. Now some of the edges can be quite difficult to understand. So we, we do have documentation for, for all the edges online. So you can look up and see like how does these edges work and how based on what are they created and, and how can attackers uh, really abuse them. So let's look a bit more closely at uh, the attack paths we see here. Um, we will use this and a little bit expanded um, attack path later on in our example, so we want to make sure that everyone understands what it means. Um, so basically, um, at member edge means that um, Andy can add any member to the help desk admins group. Um, and the interesting point for our talk here is that it will not raise any flags in, in AV or EDR software because it's a legitimate action um, which is performed on an object in Active Directory. So, um, yeah, he can use um, a variety of tools like uh, PowerShell, uh, Active Directory users and computers, or any other LDAP based tools, and um, there will be no red flags anywhere. Next one in the graph is um, generic all on a computer, which is not that obvious um, as at member. So there are still multiple um, narratives that you can abuse to gain um, um, control of um, that object. So the most easiest one we could think of is probably if uh, the company uses labs like a local admin password solution which sets automatically the password uh, of the local admin account of the computer um, and if you have full control on the computer object you can just read out the password and then you can look in it as a computer and do whatever you like. But even if there are no... Um, oh, sorry. 
um, if there's no labs configured, then there are still at least two more complicated um, attack narratives that we know of. Um, colleague of Jonas uh, Elad described them in the blog post we mentioned here. Um, we are not going to go into details about them. The point here is um, the permissions are not only always obvious what they mean and there are sometimes more than one path um, or one way to abuse these uh, ACLs. Yeah, so um, these ACL-based attack paths have been known for, for quite a while. Uh, Bloodhound has uh, had support for finding these since uh, 2017. And before that, there was all the tools that can help you find uh, abusable um, ACEs in, in Active Directory. So why is this still relevant to, to talk about? Um, what we see is that it's still a big problem for many organizations. I have two screenshots here. Um, the first one is from um, Bloodhound Enterprise. And in Bloodhound Enterprise, we classify uh, the crown jewels of the Active Directory environment, put them into this combo node here, and then we identify all the attack paths that leads to this set of crown jewels. And um, you might be able to see in the screenshot there's two attack paths here that are ACL-based. Uh, there's the generic right and right daggle uh, that leads to, to uh, the crown jewels. And that's very common that there are some attack paths that lead to, to uh, the crown jewels. But uh, the big problem here is that the purple color of the edges indicates that the exposure is above 95%. So that means that more than 95% of the principles in the environment has this path to, to crown jewels. So if an attacker gain a uh, foothold in the environment, there will be a very, like, uh, very high chance for the attacker to have an attack path to, to compromise the environment. And that's why it's, yeah. It's, it's quite, uh, quite a big problem for this organization here. The next screenshot is um, one I stole from, from Twitter uh, with permission from that user. Um, yeah, so it was a Twitter user that posted this cool looking uh, attack path uh, that looks almost like uh, a rocket. Um, but what's really cool about it is that almost all the edges in this attack path here are ACL based um, um, edges. So, it's, it it kind of indicates that we are not the only one that sees this uh, out in the wild still. So, yeah, it's, uh, it seems like it's still a big problem. So, um, we try to think about, like, why is this still a big problem? And uh, with our experience with, with, with the customers we have, uh, and we came up with, with four different reasons that we're going to, to dive into. And the first one is that uh, ACLs are, are, are complicated in extra directory. The first example of that is uh, how the AD schema works and the default security descriptor. So if we look at the screenshot we looked at earlier where we saw that uh, account arrays have full control over Andy, we can see that this permission here is, is not in inherited. It's set directly on the Andy user. Does that mean that an, an admin went in and created this ACE on Andy? No, it, 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 it's actually because when you create a new user in, in Active Directory, their um, uh, security descriptor will be set by the default security descriptor for users, which is stored in the AD schema. And in that, account operators have full control. So every time you create a, a new user, account operators gain full control. If you don't understand that, then you might not be able to remediate the problem um, of this permission. So let's say that uh, this organization here had a penetration test where an, a, a, the penetration test reports that we were able to, to compromise Andy because we gained, uh, we gained membership of the account rails group and then we could uh, yeah, reset the password of, of, of Andy. And then the organization might go in and delete this permission for Andy and all the other previous users in the environment and then they think they have solved the problem. And they do have solved the problem, but the problem is that the next time you create a new privilege user, this attack path will occur again, because then account arrays will have full control over those new users. Another example of why uh, ACLs are complicated is the admin as the holder objects. So yeah, it's a special object that I, th I think, yeah, you probably know it. But um, it is uh, located within the uh, Active Directory. It has this security descriptor, which is replicated to some of the privileged stuff within Active Directory. So, for example, the, the domain admins group and the members of domain admins will have this security descriptor 
of the admin SD holder. And this is, will be set on these um, objects every hour on a one hour schedule. So if uh, a pen tester reports that they were able to compromise um, a domain admin by an ACL permission, the uh, administrators of that organization can go in and delete these ACs from, from the domain admins and think they have solved the problem, but then within less than an hour, these uh, permissions will be restored by Active Directory immediately. So uh, yeah, they'll still be vulnerable. And this is just like two examples. There are a lot of other examples of how these ACLs are, are quite complicated. Another reason why um, these attack paths are still being found is, is that there's still like new narratives being, being found all the time. Now, Bloodhound is, is always behind on, on what like narratives that it, it has support for because we can only add stuff uh, when it's, it is being published. Um, but here's a timeline of, of what ACL-based um, edges that Bloodhound have support of um, over the years. And you can see that we have, we have added plenty of stuff um, yeah, during the last uh, six years. So if an organization uses a tool like Bloodhound to try to find and remediate all ACL-based attack paths, like they do it three years ago maybe, then, um, then they might be still be vulnerable today because we didn't have support for everything back then. We don't have that today. So yeah, continuous evaluation is, is very much needed uh, when we are trying to, to defeat this problem. Third reason is that it's difficult to determine when you look at the permission if it's good or if it's bad, right? I hinted on that um, when I talked about the ad membership um, permission. On its own, it's not a bad permission. Someone is able to add someone else to a group. This might be intended. Um, when we look at the graph here again, um, Andy works in help desk. So he's part of um, the help desk administrators and so he might be um, able to add members to uh, the server admins group because someone determined that um, the help desk is supposed to manage group membership, right? To offload it from the AD administrators, we want to have it in the help desk, so they grant um, the add member permission on, on groups, all the group objects. So this might be fine. Um, and if you look further, um, basically, I need to pull that up a bit here that I see what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so, and the server admins have the generic all on a computer object, an admin computer, which might be intended as well because, well, the server admins need to manage the servers, right? So someone have granted them maybe full control, which is the same as generic all here. Um, on all computer objects or on all server objects. So as such, the permissions make sense and someone thought about granting them at some point in time, but if you chain them together like this, um, an attack pass arises, which is not okay um, at all. And if you combine that with our last reason, um, the sheer scale of um, edges and relationships in an active directory, um, what we see here on the right, it's basically a screenshot from Bloodhound open source um, from a fairly small sized company, just uh, shy of 5,000 users. Um, and we see already in this small environment, we have, uh, I think, 350,000 ACLs and 480,000 um, relationships. Um, you can imagine you cannot go through all of them one by one and decide, okay, does it make sense or does it not make sense? So. Um, we need to find another approach on on solving that problem, right? So and this is actually what we are trying to present today. How is our approach on solving that problem? And um, yeah, what we want to point out clearly is that solving this problem is only part of the bigger problem in securing your Active Directory. I see smiles in the first, first row, the problem is known. Um, and one solution to that problem is tiering, implement tiering. Um, who has heard of tiering in the room? Show, show of hands, I'm sorry everyone. Who has implemented tiering completely? 
<laughs> okay, one uncertain hand. Okay, so a lot of work to do still. And um, what I want to highlight here is when, when we as Teal talk about tiering, um, we don't only mean, okay, implement tiering OU structure in Active Directory and move objects in there, but more or less the, the upper process here from starting with remediating quick wins over classifying your assets um, and, and securing all of them. And I think it's very important to point out uh, that the classifier systems is very important. Um, we need to define the tiers depending on the criticality of the systems. So Microsoft proposes to have three tiers, but you can have four or five, whatever you deem necessary in your environment to secure the objects based on their criticality to your environment, right? So that is a quick primer, basically, um, about uh, the whole tiering process and what we are going to talk today about is the five pillars below, um, which is define roles and responsibilities, create tiering structure, move the default um, privilege groups, remove account operators, and then move all the objects. Sounds simple, um, can be very, very tedious. Um, our recommendation is based on a guide from Microsoft. Uh, it's called Best Practice Guide for Securing Active Directory Installations. It's already from 2011, but it's the most recent um, guide from Microsoft we found. Um, and we think it's still relevant. Um, maybe later on you have a different opinion and we can discuss if you know newer sources or have a different opinion. Uh, we have time for questions later on. So, first step, define roles and responsibilities. Sounds easy, right? I'm server admin, I need full control on everything and then I can do my job. Yeah, may maybe not. Um, in reality, it's a painful and cumbersome task in the end. This is our day-to-day -day life and that's what we do. Um, we walk around with our customers and ask, hey, what's your job? What permissions do you need? And what we find more often than not is that it's unclear who is supposed to do what and that there are political views on it. Like I had a customer, Germany-based multinational company, um, Historically, um, Active Directory was mostly administered from the US, but the headquarters in Germany and the today's AD team is in Germany, but uh, still they had two domain admins in North America. And uh, the North American colleagues obviously wanted not to lose their permissions because they want to be able to run the environment, right? But now, today, uh, the company decided it's not their job anymore, and then you have to, to have these hard talks with management and with the admins and define clearly who is supposed to do what. It sounds simpler than it is. And in the end, um, you probably have something like this. Um, you, have, you have roles, you have a scope for that role, like which servers or which data center or whatever. Um, you have tasks that you are supposed to do, um, clearly understandable tasks um, and then we derive uh, or then we say this group of person needs to have uh, is in this role and they use these accounts with these permissions which we grant through these roles to do their job. This is a goal we want to reach and when we have that clearly written down then we can create the new OU structure and delegate permissions properly. Um, and um, I just want to highlight that Fabian is uh, listed here twice. Um, I will touch on that later um, when we look at the attack path again. Yeah, so uh, when the roles are defined, you can start building out an, an OU structure that uh, reflects your, your, your tiering. Um, and uh, in the screenshot here, there is an example of what it could look like, but you can customize it basically uh, as you want. The only thing that's important is that you have a clear structure because it makes it much easier to, to manage and, and um, reduce the risk of, of misconfigurations over time. And yeah, makes it a lot easier. Teal with, uh, will release uh, some, um, some um, 
Yeah, PowerShell scripts later uh, today, I guess. Um, it should be up. It should be up. Cool. <laughs> um, that can help you uh, build this uh, OU structure. Um, and they will also release a, a script that can help you configure the permissions on this OU structure. Um, what uh, what we're going to, to do is to create a new OU structure within the, the Active Directory environment and then on that OU structure on the top level then disable inheritance. So that means that all the permissions configured on the uh, head uh, object, uh, the main object of the environment will not be inherited down to, um, to the new OU structure. So all the uh, old legacy permissions that have been configured over the years will not be inherited down to the new um, OU structure. And then on that, that OU structure will um, still set these uh, permissions that um, are some Microsoft recommended permissions um, of like, yeah, the minimal uh, level of access that should be granted. And then that will be inherited down on the new OU structure. And then from there, you can set up um, delegated control. So you can, for example, allow, yeah, the, the um, service desk to reset the password of all the tier two users um, and yeah. That that they'll get down in, in the tier two um, OU and do examples like that. Yeah. One one addition maybe um, the ACLs you see on the uh, right of, of the screen is again from that uh, guide from Microsoft. It's nothing we researched. Um, so as I said, it's quite old. Um, it's still the newest we found, and uh, I welcome all the researchers to take that uh, into consideration and look if you can find security holes in it. Um, we are happy to discuss uh, the approach we've, we've chosen here. All right, third step, move default high privileged groups. So we have an empty OU structure and the same guide from Microsoft tells us, okay, now move domain admins, schema admins and enterprise admins in that OU structure. And um, they also tell us uh, in the next sentence that uh, other groups like administrators, servers, operators cannot be moved, um, but they are protected by admin SD holder, what uh, Jonas explained earlier. So this is where we differ a bit from the recommendation from Microsoft. Um, we think today, with today's knowledge, it's not enough to move these three groups, but we need need to look at all the groups in the users' containers, uh, in the users' container, um, and try to move them. There is some guidance on these built-in groups, but we, to be honest, we don't think it's reliable. It has some um, recommendation like, yeah, you can do, but we don't recommend it without any explanations. And we have seen examples where it's plainly wrong, where it states you cannot move, but you can move it and nothing happens, basically. So um, the good thing is most of our customers at least don't use much of the built-in groups, and we usually recommend um, create custom groups um, with your custom naming convention and delegate the permissions as appropriate. Leave the default as empty as you can. There are some groups you have to use. Um, and for these, try, well, all the empty groups you can just move, nothing happens. But for the groups you use or you have to use, try to move them. Um, we did not test all of them. Um, and each environment is different here. You use different software which might rely on such a group. So uh, you need to do your own testing. And the last recommendation is uh, obviously to um, monitor the group membership um, of these groups. Again, show of hand, does anybody move um, monitor group membership changes on yeah, maybe a third? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you have a question? Sure. I can repeat. Right. Instead of moving the default high privilege groups to the tiering model, I agree with the whole tiering model stuff, but why not change the default permissions of the admin as the holder object to hide those objects? Because then you don't have to move them. Yeah. You don't have to test and all that stuff because, again, if Microsoft is not recommending it, eh, if it's not needed to go there, don't go there. So the question was, why go through all the cumbersome testing uh, to move those groups? Why not just change the admin SD holder? Or I would extend it to why not change the schema? 
Um, we touch on that on the next slide, actually. You can do that, but we didn't test either, and we are not sure if anything breaks what we don't anticipate. So we think it's easier to keep the default permissions intact and try to move it to a safe place. But obviously, it's up to you. It certainly works works as well. Yeah, and, and I also add that um, I think it will be easier for administration if if you classify some of the building groups as, as different tier levels, that you have them in the, the tier OU that you have created. Because if they just live in the user's container and will be mixed up, uh, so you have like both tier zero, tier one, and tier two groups in the same container, it's, it's confusing for the organization. And sometimes like uh, the domain admin might not remember, I, I, am I allowed to use this group for, for this purpose? And yeah, it makes it easier if it's, um, yeah move to uh, a specific OU so they don't yeah, have to, to be in that situation where they, they can't tell, um, maybe. Yeah, um, account raters is one of the groups that needs some yeah, special treatment. Um, in the default security descriptor um, in the AD schema, um, account raters have full control over users, computers, and groups. So yeah, every user, computer, or group created in the exit directory will be under the full control of account operators unless they are protected by admin SD holder. So in reality, what happens is that account operators have full control over most of the objects in, in uh, tier two and tier one and, and some part of tier zero as not everything will be protected in, in, uh, by admin SD holder in tier zero. So it's a very privileged group. Um, we do recommend to not, not to use it, and that's also Microsoft's recommendation, because it's, it is very privileged, um, and yeah, it's, it's better to create these uh, delegated groups that have control over specific uh, objects within the uh, organization. And if you need full control over everything, then you're probably a domain admin anyways. Um, yeah. You can't go like one step further uh, and, and remove the permissions of um, of account operators, you can do that by going in and, and changing the um, the AD schema and uh, removing account operators from the default security descriptor. Um, but yeah, changing the AD schema is 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 something that you probably shouldn't do um, too often uh, because yeah, you don't know if there's any like tools that will rely on some crazy permission or yeah. So uh, we do recommend to instead just clean up the permissions. Uh, with a script, and and, um, and Teal has also written a parsing script that you can use for that. And uh, I know Teal used that script to uh, to help their customers clean up these uh, permissions for both account operators and also print operators. And then they run it with a scheduled task, such as, yeah, to make sure that everything within a specific OU will not have any permissions uh, from account operators or um, print operators. And, and again, the narrative would be, we don't want to touch the schema because we want to avoid side effects. From our point of view, it seems much easier to just have a scheduled task running for your secured OU structure, which runs fi every 15 minutes usually in our case, which is enough um, when new objects get created and we just delete the accounts. Yeah. Oh, nice. and then you can yeah, and, and now then this was all relatively simply, maybe except for the roles and responsibilities, but now comes the hard part, basically. The structure is there, the default uh, groups are there, and now you start delegating permissions, you create new accounts. Um, in the beginning, I pointed out Fabian is twice in the list, two different roles, so if you have a tiering structure and someone works in two different tiers for two different topics, um, like one of my customers, they have the rule that all the back end, it's a smaller customer, all the back end IT team needs to do help desk duty once in a while just to get in touch with the end users so they don't forget uh, who they are working for all day. Um, so they are domain admins and they perform domain maintenance and, and operation and on the other hand they do like a help desk tasks on the other day. So in that case, um, in the tiered structure, they would use two different accounts for that, probably. 
Um, so you create all that, you um, obviously train your admins how to work with these accounts and the new systems and the new permissions they have. Um, you create lock-on restriction policies so that a tier zero admin cannot log on to a tier two system. Could be a lock-on restriction policy or a authentication silo, which is the better, better option of the two. Um, and then basically you start to move all your objects in the right tier and this is really cumbersome because you need um, support of the application owner because they need to test if the, per if the application still works with the permissions the service accounts get and uh, maybe computer objects. Um, we usually have problems with um, with applications that do LDAP queries and you have to specify the OU where they query. Um, so there are lots of, bit of bits and pieces that need to work together that you can move an application and the users that use that application um, into that secured structure. So you need some kind of wave planning or project planning or whatever to, to get that done and depending on the size of the organization that can take some time, right? And what it should do, or what you must do, basically, if you don't create new objects for, for whatever reason, uh, but you move them, you obviously need to make sure that you clean up the directly set permissions. As Jonas said, uh, many of the permissions get inherited, but someone might have gone in in the past and just granted, as in that example, Manuel, full control uh, of that group object. And when you move that group to the secured OU structure, the permission gets moved with it. And maybe you don't want to have it. You might, but you might not. Um, so probably the most easiest way is just to click on that restore default button. Um, and in, in this is a piece where we usually then um, change the name. That's why I highlighted the, the box above. Uh, we introduce a naming convention where it's clear which tier it is, what, kind, what group type it is. Um, there are different ways you can nest groups and stuff, you probably know that. This is where all that stuff gets done um, over quite a period of time to get the whole company moved. Same applies for GPOs. GPOs have uh, ACLs as well, new OU structure. You need obviously to link some, some GPOs. If you reuse them, have a look at the permissions as well. Last step. Yeah, so once again, we want to look at this, this attack path here and, and see like uh, what will happen if we follow that approach that we just uh, talked about. So we have now uh, like classified systems. So Andy has been classified as a tier two user and the group helpdesk admins has been classified as a tier two group. Um, so what happens is that um, this, this edge here will be um, remediated and uh, Andy can no longer uh, reset or add members to the uh, server admins uh, group because that group has been classified as a tier one group. So it lives in a different container and permissions for the help desk admins group has been uh, revoked. So the path is broken here and it's also broken later on here because we have classified this server here as a tier one server and Fabian is a tier zero user with his uh, domain admin account. So he's no longer uh, allowed to log into this system with his domain admin account. So we have broken the attack path here up into, um, into three. And uh, yeah, this is just to, to yeah, visualize how um, these like bit complicated attack paths that, that can occur in an environment can be, can be broken up by defining a, a tiering structure and implementing that in your environment. Um, the last note that we want to add here is, is that you'll then, of course, need a continuous evaluation to, to check if any misconfigurations will happen in the future as yeah, domain admins can still perform uh, um, yeah, uh, delegation of, of permissions that could break the, the tiering. So um, it's a good idea to evaluate if it still works. And uh, that's the last slide of, uh, of our presentation. Thanks a lot for, for listening.
Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, questions? Yeah, thank you very much. Very good talk. Uh, I'm always happy if people present Bloodhound to people because I think it's still very complicated and <laughs> people should know about it. Um, so my question, I hope it's not a little bit off topic, but I recently ran into this thing, uh, basically best practice recommended by Pincastle, that you should remove authenticated users from this pre-Windows 2000 uh, group. And I have, so far, I was not able to convince the domain admin to try it in production. <laughs> and I, I was wondering, would this basically, yeah, would Bloodhound not work anymore if you would do this? Because as I understand it, this would mean I couldn't read arbitrary objects anymore. Or like, what, do you know what it does basically removing this group? Um, to be honest, uh, I, have, I have no clue. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I haven't tried it, uh, to be honest. We, um, we did um, for one of my customers and um, then it's right, you cannot, well, it was a bit undecisive to be honest. Um, the admins couldn't read the group membership, um, which should not happen actually. Um, but what we definitely recommend to do is remove the everyone group. Um, I would even suggest if you can remove the authenticated users and put only the groups where, for example, your tier zero admins are in, in the group. If you have problems reading object properties, um, which I try to replicate in my own environment um, and I could read it without a problem. So, um, but still. We had applications which did LDAP queries that didn't work. So, for example, we had a firewall which did user-based firewall rule set uh, which needs to query all objects. Um, this we added in, in the group as well. Any more questions? Well, it wasn't a question, it was basically an answer to that gentleman's question. Um, the pre-Windows pre pre 2000 group is, is, because it has the compatible name, it's just to, back in the day, to support the integration with NT4 and give it similar permissions, everything. If you find anonymous logon in the pre-Windows 2000 group, get rid of it. If you find everyone, as the presenter mentioned, get rid of, get rid of it. If you find authenticated users uh, in there, test if you can get rid of it. <laughs> because uh, that was basically my answer to you, but he already mentioned it. Um, many applications or actions de may depend on the authenticated users being in the pre-Windows 2000 compatible group. A way to solve that at first is, of course, in a separated environment, test every single application and action. Now, if at some point in time you decide, okay, let's remove it, put a custom group in that pre-Windows 2000 compatible group, and then any service account or action or whatever that requires to be in that group, put it in there. And then you have basically cut down everything to just the applications that actually need that specific permission. But you need to seriously test it, because if you just remove authenticated users, don't take your weekend off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think you have a great blog post on that online as well, right? San Paris, I think. Yeah. Are there more questions? Okay, we don't have uh, further more questions. So thank you very much again for your talk.